This is kind of a quick question because it, it, it just made me think about that. Sure. I had it here. Uh, what did Sears uh, think of McClellan and Landscape Turn Red? It's probably the best, the yes. most well-known uh, work on Antietam. Uh, how does yours differ from that, and do you agree and disagree in places? Uh, well, uh, about the about the battle itself, uh, we're largely in agreement. Uh, where I disagree is is really it's a matter of partly of, of emphasis and partly of interpretation. Sears says it's impossible to imagine that McClellan would ever have led a military coup, and in a literal sense, I suppose that's true. But McClellan was capable of imagining his leading a military coup. He imagined it constantly. Um, and to play with such ideas, to speak of such ideas to a cadre of loyal officers in the midst of a civil war is an extraordinarily dangerous thing to do. Um, and uh, he's toying with fire. There's one other uh, thing, that, that, that incident that clarified my thinking about this and made me di disagree with Sears, with whom, I, as I say, I otherwise tend to agree. And that was an, um, uh, an incident that occurred while McClellan was pursuing Lee beyond Frederick in the, in the uh, Antietam campaign, an officer from McClellan's staff named Thomas Key sits down with a reporter from the New York Tribune, and he says, you know, there's a bunch of officers in McClellan's staff who want to change front on Washington uh, and compel, uh, compel the government to make peace with the Confederacy, and they're fighting for a boundary line, not for the Union. Uh, but, but McClellan would disapprove of this if he knew it. And for a connoisseur of news leaks, this one smells to high heaven. First of all, the New York Tribune is the most anti-McClellan newspaper in the country. Their kindest word for him is imbecile. Uh, traitor is more, uh, is, is more. So why tell this to a, a Tribune reporter, and why not tell it to McClellan? and have him tell his officers to cut it out. And what I think it is is what we call a false leak. Uh, it's disinformation. What McClellan is doing at this point, he's just been restored to command. He's putting out rumors of a coup, or his men are, or his people are doing it for him. Um, uh, he's putting out rumors of a coup to pressure the Lincoln government. He says, look, this could happen. You're in danger here. You better do what McClellan says, he wants, he wants Stanton removed, and you'd better pay some heed to it. The Tribune picks this up instantly. The next day, and the day after, there were two editorials. The, the, there's, a, there's a coup being planned. The generals are going to make a deal with their southern compatriots. The New York Herald picks it up as well and says, yeah, darn right. Uh, McClellan should do what Cromwell did, should disperse Congress with the bayonet, is, is, the, is the allusion. Um, and um, he should require the government to give him indemnity for past wrongs and immunity for future operations. Mm -hmm. And New, uh, George Templeton Strong, the great diarist, New York is full of rumors of this coup. Well, it's, that's a beautiful false leak. It had exactly the effect that, that I think was, was, uh, was calculated there. So that's why I, that's why I say that, that imagining a coup and imagining it in, in such a public and semi-public way in the midst of a civil war is itself a, uh, a movement in that, uh, in that uh, direction. Uh, we had a question that came in, and uh, if others, uh, I forgot to say at the beginning, please do put your first name and where you're from. We'd like to know uh, and give you that, that moment as well. Uh, and we're going to come to your question, which is, do you think that McClellan's aversion to hard war and bloodshed was a factor in the friction between him and McClellan and Lincoln? But let me start out first, because that's, yeah. that, this is going to lead into that okay. uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation, okay. which, of course, was radical, and you say it is. And let's find out what really saved that day, as, as you mentioned in here. You write of four areas of the radical nature. Yes. of the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, confiscation of property without yes. knowing whose That's right. you were taking and whether they were loyal or not. That's right. Slaves uh, could not be re-enslaved after the war by the courts. Uh, slaves may defend themselves. Mac, McClellan, Mac, I keep saying in here, um, thought that was a servile insurrection call. Um, and that also freedmen may enlist into the army. 
uh, which you write help perhaps alleviate some of the insurrection feelings that yeah. these freedmen might have. They could go into the war right. and fight for others' freedom as well as their own. So the original concept was a war measure, but you're saying emancipation actually changed the character of the war into yes. a total war. Yeah, uh, I th a couple of things. Uh, up until 1862, Lincoln is thinking in terms of what he called conciliation. Make the hurt the South badly enough so that it wants to make peace, but promise them that they can uh, keep slavery, and they might be willing to negotiate a peace. By July 1, he knows that that's impossible, that the South is really committed to its, to its independence, and they're committed to slavery. He can't even get the border states to, to, be, to, to accept compensated emancipation. And so he decides that he's gotta, if he's going to break the South, and that's what he's got to do, he's got to attack slavery. He also knows that if he does that, a negotiated peace will be impossible. And that means a commitment to total war. And uh, I think he does that knowingly. Um, Your definition of total war? Total war is the, you're going to destroy the, the social system and the economic basis of your enemy's society. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to do it, in, the, in this case, not by strategic bombing, but you're going to do it by a political act, by declaring the slaves free and, and making your army the means of, of freeing them, but also inviting them to, to do their own freedom. Um, uh, it, it's a revolutionary act, and, and the, re the reason I say that he understands that it's a commitment to total war, he first drafts it in July, and he gives, and if he had issued it then when he wanted to, uh, the Confederacy would have had roughly six months to comply till, July, till January 1st. He doesn't issue it until September 22nd, 1862. Same deadline. Only less than three months for the Confederacy to comply. He doesn't imagine that the Confederacy is going to make this the better, in, in, in three months, the basis of a negotiation. He knows that this, act, this is a revolutionary act. And the act, by, as you said, it's revolutionary. It's, it's confiscation of property without judicial process. The property confiscated, the value of slave property confiscated is three and a half billion dollars. The total wealth of the United States, that is of all property in the United States in the 1860s, is roughly 16 billion. So with one stroke of the pen, he confiscates a quarter of the national wealth. Uh, it's, it's like Henry VIII taking over the, the, the monasteries. It's a revolutionary act. The other things that you, you mentioned, uh, he says, he, he, say, he ur urges blacks not to use violence, in, in, but he says, except in a necessary self-defense. And the fundamental law of slavery, the fundamental principle of discipline on a plantation is that a slave has no right of self-defense. If the master punishes, that's it. The slave can't even sue in court for abusive treatment. There is no self-defense. By granting blacks the right of self-defense, that means that um, uh, they can appeal to army officers and judges coming down with, against their masters. They can act against their masters. In, and, the, and if there are federals around, they'll, they'll support them. That's a revolutionary act. And lastly, enlisting in the army, the, the, uh, the right to serve in defense of the country, in the common defense, is a civil right, which was denied to blacks in every state of the Union, including the free states. Lincoln establishes the civil right to serve. And uh, that's, a, that's a, um, as Frederick Douglass says, that's, that's a major triumph. 180,000 blacks will serve, uh, roughly 9% of the 2 million men who served in the Union Army throughout the war. But all of the blacks serve in the last two years of the war, mm -hmm. when the federal army varies between about 700,000 and a million. So the black contribution is more on the order of 15% of the troop strength of the Union. You can't win the war without black troops. No matter what capacity, they are serving in combat capacity, but even the ones who are, who are serving in garrison roles, you cannot win the Civil War without the black troops. So Lincoln was fairly courageous in yeah. placing the, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation 
before the election. Yes. And did he consciously do that? Were there other pressures that made him do it perhaps earlier than he might have? He risked his presidency. Uh, no, he was always going to do it before the election. He wanted to do it in, in July. And I think it's partly his, um, his principled honesty. This is the platform on which I'm asking you to support me. If you don't want to support me, now's the time to say. And although the Republicans lose, as James McPherson points out, it's kind of like a typical mid-year election. They fall back. They retain their, the majorities that they need in Congress, and the war goes on, and goes on without McClellan. Uh, so, going to the question, yes. he hardened the war. He mm. really expanded um, the war powers of the executive branch yes. uh, in many ways. Uh, one way, of course, here's a draft notice that I happen to have yeah. uh, in 63, of July of 63, but nonetheless, uh, that's one of the ways that he was expanding it. He immediately took habeas corpus into his yes. pocket. Yeah. Um, and, of course, uh, newspapers were taken down. I have a libertarian cousin who still rails against Lincoln for, <laughs> yeah. these, for these things. He does. Yeah. Uh, um, so, Actually, the, there was, uh, I was just at a, at a meet, uh, conference with uh, Judge Frank Williams, um, and he pointed out that the, um, Lincoln's actions uh, in establishing military commissions in wartime are, per, are perhaps unconstitutional but were never tested in the Supreme Court until the Guantanamo case uh, recently. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court's reversing of the, the military commissions established by the Bush administration was also the court's first commentary on Lincoln's military commissions as well. Here we are, uh, 45 minutes into this, and yeah. we haven't even gotten to the battle. Yes, there uh, we, which I we want had to do. That question there. There's yeah. a question that came in on that, yeah. but before that, I'm going to preempt that. I'm sorry, uh, we don't have a name on this either. Uh, but I want to ask you this: There was, you talked about it before, an anonymous journalism campaign. Yes. From numbers of people, thank you. Now John Hay was doing some of this. Yes. And he yes. Uh, he uh, describes he, he likened. McClellan to Stonewall Jackson yes. is a very telling point. Um, you say also that Lincoln was writing these as well, or some. Do you know which ones he wrote, and how do we know that? Uh, well, no, he wasn't writing stuff for the papers. No, he was not doing. For no, no, no. His, uh, but the, I misread that. The uh, uh, it was Hay who was uh, was under right. Lincoln's instructions was writing anti-McClellan stuff in uh, in the papers. And um, uh, Lincoln, right, had an, Lincoln had another way to, um, uh, to get under McClellan's skin once he decided to get rid of him, which he does. As soon as McClellan wins the battle, McClellan thinks the battle makes him I I immune to attack, and in fact it makes him perfectly dispensable. Um, Lincoln starts sending McClellan the kinds of letters that are designed to drive McClellan straight up the wall. The most famous one is, what have your horses done um, in, the, in the last six weeks to make any horse tired. But the better one is Lincoln lays out a plan of campaign and he explains to McClellan how he can circumvent Lee's army, how he can get around Lee's army, and he does it by presenting a simple exercise in Euclidean geometry. He lectures mm -hmm. one of, the, one of the, the, the top man in his class in military engineering on Euclidean economics. He lectures this man who has complete contempt for him as a frontier ignoramus. My, I, I, it's just my notion, I think he did it to drive McClellan bonkers and to drive him into doing something like resigning. And when that fails, he fires him. Uh, Doug from Richmond asked a question about the Illinois Central. And if you go back to the beginning yeah. of this, you may not have been there, Doug, uh, you'll see the, uh, the talk that we had about McClellan being at the Illinois Central yes. and uh, what they knew about it and how that may or may not have been part of the conflict that came later. It's kind of downplayed, frankly.